So welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to our next session in the virtual conference on epistemic uncertainty in engineering. Um, I'm delighted to, to welcome two speakers today from uh, addressing uncertainty arithmetic, or loosely speaking, and uncertainty, uh, as Didier, Didier has kindly reminded me. Um, we, so we have two speakers, Didier Dubois and uh, Laura Swyler here today um, from, from the US and from France. So this, this conference is as part of uh, the University of Liverpool's Institute for Risk and Uncertainty talk that they've collaborated with the University of Sheffield as part of the DigiTwin program, which is sponsored by the UKRI. Um, and we've also managed to achieve sponsorship from the Society for Risk Analysis as well. Um, so I'll just to remind people of the, the future talks that we have scheduled. We have the 25th of March, um, admitting what you don't know with Gerg Gigarenza and Anne Bostrom. Um, and then we have another talk, which we've, we've yet to announce a date, but at the moment we're looking at mid-April um, due to the speaker's availability. So our agenda for today, um, starting with Professor Didier Dubois um, at three o'clock, well, now, <laughs> the unified view of uncertainty theories, uh, followed at four o'clock with Professor Laura Swyler um, talking about epistemic uncertainty, computation, usage. So both those talks will have Q&A followed for around 15, 20 minutes. And then lastly, we'll, we'll wrap up with an open discussion. Do epistemic and aleatory need different calculi at five o'clock? will last roughly half an hour. Sometimes it overruns, but obviously everyone's feel free to, to leave it uh, 5.30 um, if you have anything else to attend. So I'd like to firstly introduce Professor Didier Dubois, which I'm sure many of you have, uh, have met already and, and was a part of the, the REC 2018 conference that we had. Um, he's uh, the Professor Emeritus at the University of Paul Sabatier in Toulouse, France. Um, and research director at the Centre uh, National de la Recherche Scientifique, the CNRS, at the Institut de Recherche en Informatique de Toulouse. He was educated as a civil engineer of aeronautics at the French National School, School of Aeronautics and Space, and he earned his doctorate there in engineering. He's also got a second doctorate, um, and he, he's a fellow at the International Fuzzy Systems Association and was named one of the 300 most cited French scientific authors by the Institute for Scientific Information. So I'd, let's, uh, let's welcome Didier and would you like to start your presentation? Thank you very much. Okay, so I have to move, uh, to switch. Okay, I'm not sure. Partager l'écran, okay. So can you hear me, I suppose? Uh, so I share, I share the screen. Okay, and I suppose that, oh. We can see oh, that okay cool. as well. So actually, I, yeah. so, so I think every, it's okay, you can see the slide. Yeah, we can see So it. I changed the, the title a little bit because I decided to focus the talk on the expressiveness of probability measures to just to try to justify other uncertainty calculi. Actually, I will not deal with uncertainty arithmetics proper, but I rather deal with the topics for the, the, the discussion later on. I mean, it is more centered on that. So, and it's also dedicated more to, I would say beginners than to uh, maybe experienced researchers, but anyway. So was, I'll start with the idea of uncertainty and the problem of representing graded belief. And just to say that uncertainty just means that an agent does not know the truth value of a proposition. So you can express uncertainty in lingu linguistically speaking in terms of probability, in terms of possibility, or in terms of certainty. So you use this word like it's quite possible it, knows, it snows tomorrow, for instance. So these, these terms don't have exactly the same meaning. And the question of uncertainty theory is to evaluate this type of notions, uh, that, uh, namely the probability, the possibility, or the certainty that the proposition is true or false. So you start with that. And rather that explain, people is, speak sometimes about types of uncertainty. I prefer to, to speak about origins of uncertainty because uncertainty is just not knowing how to answer yes or no to a question. So the origins can be several. So there is a variability of natural phenomena, which means randomness. 
This is often called aleatory uncertainty. So for instance, when you, th when you play with coins or with dice, the problem is how to know the, next out the outcome of the next throw. You can test the die a lot of time, yet you're always uncertain about the next throw. And this is randomness. Then, but another source of uncertainty is just the lack of information. When you just miss information, you, are, you would like to have to answer the question. And so this, this has nothing to do with randomness, of course. And, and, and it's a very general situation because very often you don't have all information in the world. And the last uh, source of uncertainty is conflicting testimonies or reports. And then you, you face inconsistencies to, in some sense, too much information and you are, you are again in situation of uncertainty. I will be dealing with the two first items in this talk. So if you use a, a probability measure, that means you use a set of weights that sum to one to represent your state of knowledge. And the question is, what is the meaning of these weights? And of course, uh, the, the possible meanings uh, you, you see in the literature, the oldest is the idea of counting favorable cases over the number of possible cases by assuming symmetry. Uh, like this is a case with coins, dice, or cards, and things like that, you can do that. Another way of measuring probability is using frequencies from statistical information, and then the probability is a limit frequency of occurrence of, of, of the, the states. And this can be called objective probabilities because you observe them. And the last thing is subjective probability where you're directly modeling your beliefs and you're measuring using money involved in a betting scheme. I just want to make some remarks about the, the first remark about the, the expressiveness of probability. Uh, it's computationally simple, of course, but uh, the convention is that uh, when you put zero means impossible, one means certain for an event. And so when you are ignorant, you're bound to, to take the midpoint, like one half for ignorance. And this, as, as I will see, I will explain is a bit problematic. Uh, so basically objective probability is generic knowledge because it's statistic from a population, while subjective probability is always assigned to singular events, single events. And then you, are, you, you attach degrees of belief to them. So this is one difference between the two. So the pro probabilities have been, has been used to play the two roles actually, to represent randomness, capturing variability, and to represent partial knowledge, representing belief in the face of information defect. And by the way, the two issues are not uh, mutually exclusive. You can have partial knowledge about random phenomena, of course. So the question is to measure beliefs now. So if you uh, have frequencies and you can observe a, a variability, then you can apply a King principle, which means that the degree of belief on the n plus one trial outcome is equated to frequency of the n, I mean, when you, based on the n previous observations of a repeatable phenomenon, so that you equate the, the, the probability of A being true the next time to the frequency of A was true in the past. So the, when you get this frequency, you can measure your belief in this way, but sometimes you are just unique events. And then you could just kind of have belief, but you cannot compute any frequencies. So in that case, you are, in order to measure belief, you use usually betting rates on lottery tickets for non-repeatable events. And sometimes people just, use by a kind of analogical reasoning using frequencies, exper thought frequency experiment, experiments, but I'm not very much personally convinced by this way of, uh, of measuring probability. I'm more interested in the betting uh, behavior. And so just to, to recall what, what it means. So you, you want to measure the belief degree of an agent, let's say on the occurrence of a state SI. And this goes back to definity to the, especially Bruno Definetti, but also Ramsey and, and other people in the 30s. So you measure this degree of belief at the price of a lottery ticket with re reward one currency unit if the state is SI in a betting game. So the idea is the following, you are the banker sells ticket, the gambler proposes prices, and 
the exchange prices, the exchange role, I'm sorry, if the price is, is proposed by the gambler is too low. So if you do this game, then suppose that the player buys all lottery tickets and the state SJ is observed, then the gambler gain is, is one because it's a reward minus the price of the tickets he paid. And it is the, the, the sum of the ticket prices that, that he, he could collect minus the reward for the banker. So because of the exchangeability, if the sum of the PI, PJs is not one, either the gambler loses money or the banker would lose money and then he exchanges role with the gambler. So the only pos rational possibility is to have the sum is one. So you get a probability distribution. This is the explanation of subjective probabilities. Another consequence, the Bayesian people, the people that use Bayesian probability make a postulate that any state of knowledge should be represented by a single probability distribution. So either due to the use of this exchangeable betting procedure or by using frequencies, okay? And if you don't do that, they consider you are irrational because you are bound to money loss, for instance, in, in, in the betting behavior story. So as a consequence of the Bayesian credo, in case of total ignorance, you are bound, for instance, to use a uniform probability distribution because you don't have any reason to put more money on one outcome than on the other. But the question is whether uniform distributions do represent ignorance, and I would claim that they don't. And the reason is uh, first that they are ambiguous because you will represent two situations in the same, same way. And they are instable, they are not scale invariant. If you change the, the reference the universe, you, you, you cannot maintain the, 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 the ignorance representation. And then there is some empirical falsification that people it show that when information miss, is missing, for instance, decision makers never or very seldom choose according to a single subjective probability. And this is Ellsberg paradox that I will recall briefly for those who don't know Ellsberg paradox. So this, this idea of representing, uh, I mean, ignorance by uh, uniform probability goes back to Laplace actually would, with this principle of insufficient reason. He, he claimed that what is equipossible should be equiprobable. And then he states the problem, a problem in such a way to make the elementary events equiprobable so by symmetry, you, 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 you get a uniform probability. Uh, this type of a choice of a uniform probability in the presence of ignorance is also sometimes justified by the principle of maximum entropy. entropy. But uh, then based on that, it's easy to believe that uniform probability distributions represent ignorance. <clears throat> but actually th there are, as I said, three problems. The first one is that single distributions do not distinguish between incompleteness and variability. So it's whether you have precisely observed random observations or you are missing information, you go to uniform probability on the, in the two cases. For instance, a fair die tested many times and a new die never tested. If you have to assign probabilities to facets, you would do the same. So, but of course you have to admit that if you have uh, frequencies, the information you, you, you have is very, very different. The state of information you are in is very different from uh, the case of total ignorance where you have a new die. So this is uh, very different and this is problematic. Another problem is that the uniform probability, probabilistic representation of ignorance are uh, instable. So for, for instance, I, I state the pro problem in general, and then I give examples. So suppose you have different domains, U1 and U2, that are used to describe the same problem. But for instance, you have different vocabularies. So you take uh, the most refined state space U, uh, in which you can express U1 and U2. So you have one too many maps from U2 to U1 and U to U2. And if you put a uniform distribution on U1 to express your ignorance, it's uh, in general, you can, we, we claim that it's in general not compatible with a uniform probability representation on the other scale, U2. 
Okay, and of course that it should not be equivalent is something natural, it's not a paradox if the distribution represents frequencies because when you move to, from U1 to U2, the uniform distribution of frequencies on U1 would deliver a different distribution on U2. And I mean, the frequencies are just respected but the, not the uniform distribution. But it become, becomes paradoxical if ignorance is represented by uniform distribution because ignorance on U1 means ignorance on, on U2 as well, but you get a problem. And I, let's, let me show you some well-known examples for those who don't know them. So suppose you are asked whether there is life outside earth or no life. So typical, typical problem with, where we basically ignore. And so ignorance response would be to put one half, one half. Now, if you ask the question, the same questions with a slightly different point of view, you ask for animal life, vegetal life only, or no life. So again, you are, now you have three op options and the ignorance response would be one third, one third, one third, because they have no idea what is more likely than the, uh, what, what state is more likely than the other one. Yeah, so it's very clear that they are inconsistent answer because if you move, if you express case one in case two, the, 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 the uniform distribution of case one in, in, the, in the case two universe, that you see that probability of life is two third greater than no life. So this is information that life is more likely. But if you move from case two to case one, then because you, you I mean, in, in terms of case one, you would split the probability one half into two and get one fourth because you don't know about animal life versus vegetal life, but you already shown propose one, one, two, one half, one half. So you would get probability of animal life equal one fourth smaller than probability of no life, which is uh, not exactly what we li would like to have. Because what you see is when you change from one scale to the other, ignorance produces information. So uniform probability of distinct representations of the state space are, are the in inconsistent. And so the conclusion is that a prob unique probability distribution cannot model incompleteness and ignorance. And the same happens in the infinite case, because if you consider a variable, a numerical variable X, let's say a positive variable, then you, you have the same knowledge about X as about, let's say another function of X. You take F a bijection, which is nonlinear, such as one over X and, or log of X. I mean, if you know that X belongs to the interval AB, this is a, absolutely equivalent to say that one over X belongs to the interval one over B, one over A. But it's very well known that the uniform distribution of AB is incompatible with the uniform distribution of one over B, one over A for one over X. So because it's not scale invariant. So uniform distribution on one set will, would give you a non-uniform. So again, you are producing knowledge. You, you, you seem as if, as if you're producing knowledge. And so again, uniform distributions do not represent ignorance. But again, for frequencies distribution, it's no problem that the, the distribution on A, B for X would not be the same as the distribution of one minus X, one over X. It's not a problem for frequencies distribution. This is expected, but not for ignorance, of course. So if you say, okay, ignorance means identical belief for any event different from the, from the true one and the impossible ones, identical belief for all contingent in events, say one half, then this set function that would give one half to all contingent events uh, is clearly not a probability measure at, in any case. In the life and other planets example, for instance, when you take the th three, ev three, three element case, you get six possible events and they, whatever the probability measure, they cannot have the same probability. So you cannot represent ignorance by probability. People have tried to show that as well from an empirical point of view uh, by uh, questioning uh, the savage theory in the 60s uh, by uh, uh, Ellsberg, uh, made some uh, experiments with people showing that they don't respect uh, the classical decision theories proposed by Savage, 
who claims that decision makers choose according to expected utility with respect to a subjective probability. So the counter examples is well known for those who don't know it, I recall it. So you suppose you have an urn that contains one third of red balls and two thirds of balls that are black or white, but you don't know the proportion of them. So if you are a Bayesian and you need a single probability distribution because you don't have any reason to put more weight on white than on black, you would put a, a uniform probability on the urn. Now the game is to choose between games where you pick a ball and you win or lose some money depending on the outcome. And so you, you compute the expected utility criterion, which I, is written here. And uh, based on a subjective probability distribution, PR, PW, PB. Okay. So the, in the experiments of Ellsberg, he proposed to people to choose between two bets, B1 and B2, where the first one you win $1 if uh, you pick a red ball. And the second is you, you, you win $1 if you, you pick a white ball. And most people prefer B1 to B2 because in some sense they are sure that there are red balls, but they are not sure that there are white balls in some sense. So they, pre they all prefer B1 to B2. And then the, the same similar question is asked with two other uh, gambles, B, B, B3, B4, two other games, uh, which are the same as the previous one, but you just add $1 on black. So you win one if it's red or black, uh, and you win $1 for before if you are black or white. And then in that case, uh, most people prefer B4 to B3 because you, they know that the number of uh, the proportion of black or wh white balls is two thirds. But if you, any person that prefers B1 to B2 and B4 to B3 is in full contradiction with utility theory because you violate what is called the Schrossing principle. And basically, if you compute the utilities uh, of uh, B1 and B2 before B3, uh, and you are adding the, the, the two inequalities you get by, uh, uh, by, by your preference, but then you get the two terms that are equal, which is a contradiction. So there does not exist any unique probability that can account for the behavior of the uh, of the people that were, they, they, when they were preferring bets, they were violating the Schrödinger principle, which uh, Schrödinger principle say that the ordering acts using expected utility uh, sh should not depend on the states where both acts have the same consequences. And as I said, uh, in that case, the B four B three you just add $1 on black, that's all you do. So you should, uh, if you prefer B1 to B2, according to utility theory, you should be prefer B3 to B4, but this is not the case. All people change, uh, I mean, switch uh, for B, 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 B3 and B4. And the plausible explanation of experts paradox is that people don't use the same probability in the two choice, uh, in the two choices. Uh, when, when they are to prefer B1 to B2, then in some sense, they suppose that there is no white ball. And so they are afraid to choose uh, the case of winning uh, uh, money on the white ball. They prefer to win money on the, uh, uh, the, the case when you, you win money on the red ball. But in the second choice, they make the opposite uh, assumption that there, there are no black balls. And so they don't use the same probability measure in the two cases. And so, as you say, the, the, the conclusion is that because of they are pessimistic, this is, uh, these decision makers, the subjective probability will depend on the proposed games and they are ranking decisions by lower expectation. But their state of knowledge is a family of probability distribution. It's not a unique distribution in that case, clearly. So just a summary of the uh, on, on this issue. So the Bayesian dogma that any knowledge, state of knowledge can be represented of a, uh, by a single probability uh, does not distinguish between uh, randomness and lack of knowledge. You have this problem of, of scale sensitiveness. 
And uh, the fact that in the present, when information is missing, decision makers do not always choose according to a single subjective probability. So the, actually the main issue with single probability measure is that with a, a probability measure, you cannot distinguish between disbelief in A when there is strong evidence against A and the lack of belief in A when there is no in evidence in favor of A. So, and this is because probability of not A is one minus probability of A. Well, the idea of ignorance and there is no evidence neither for nor against A. So that means that in practice, this is why we need two set functions. Where one for expresses, expressing certainty and the other one for plausibility. So you need two monotonic set functions instead of a single one uh, that would reduce to probability if they were equal. But now you have, because you have two set functions, you are much better for the basic conventions at the extreme cases. So for impossibility, you put the upper function plausibility to zero. For certainty, you put the lower uh, function to one. And when you are ignorant, you put the lower function to zero and the upper function to one. So plausibility one, certainty zero. This just means ignorance, whatever the, the, the scale is. And of course, the certainty is something more demanding than plausibility. So certainty of A is smaller than plausibility. And you have also duality that says that uh, when something is certain, it means that the converse is impossible. So you have that the plausibility of A is one minus the certainty of not A. And many uncertainty theories fit with these conventions. Basically, the, the simplest one, simplest case is a case where you just represent your, your uncertainty by a subset of mutually exclusive values in a set E. And so you just say that all I know is X is, belongs to E. So that E is a, this set E is an epistemic state, state. You can refine it using a fuzzy set instead of a crisp set to express that some states are more possible than others. And when you have incomplete frequentist knowledge, means that you don't know exactly the, what, what is a good probability distribution representing your frequencies, then you use an epistemic state on, on frequency distributions. Typically, you use a, what we call a cradle set, which is a convex set of probability. And now, if you have this cradle set of probabilities, to each event, you can attach a probability interval. You, for the certainty, you use the lower probability. And for the plausibility, you use the upper probability, which satisfies the, the framework I just mentioned. And by the way, I just mentioned that there is a subjectivistic, sub subjectivist interpretation to, to this framework, where the lower probability is a degree of belief measured by the maximal price for buying a lottery ticket, just like in the case of definity. But now there is no exchangeability assumption. That is to say, the upper probability is a minimal price for selling a lottery ticket, and it just has to be greater than the buying price. And you have special cases of, of, of this uh, cradle set uh, case. So when you are just representing your knowledge by an epistemic state, uh, a set of possible values for the variable, you can compute a, a certainty function, which is Boolean, and which is one if E belongs to A, well, that is to say A is true in all uh, elements of E, in all states of E. And so this is a very simple notion of uh, certainty, which you find in modal logic, for instance. And so you can define set function N and the dual set function pi, which is one if E and A are compatible and zero otherwise. So this is a simplest representation. And it represents a cradle set, which is just a set of probabilities such that probability of E is one. But this is a, this is a connection with modal logic, for instance. And also you can extend this using a fuzzy set instead of, a, uh, of the characteristic function of a set. And then you define again the, the pi and the n function, the way you can see on the slide. And again, it represents a cradle set. You just com compute the degree of necessity and you take the probabilities that dominate the necessity for 11. And this is a cradle set in the, usual, in the sense of the previous slide. And, and uh, another, if, particular case that of uh, uh, upper lower probability that you can find in the literature is Dempster-Schaefer approach, 
where you define a probability distribution on, over epistemic states and, and not about objective states. And so you compute uh, the degree of belief as the expected necessity in the sense of this Boolean necessity up there by summing the weights of the epistemic states that imply A. And this is, represents again a cradle set uh, for the set of probabilities that are greater than Bell for, for all event A. So all these theories correspond to cradle sets. So now you have a, a, a representation level where you have families of probability. Now, if you would like to apply uh, again, expected utility as a criterion when you make choice, you would like to choose a, a probability distribution. So if, for SMET, you may distinguish two representation level, what you call the cradle level where you represent beliefs states of the agents uh, accounting for partial ignorance, for instance, using belief functions. Uh, you are, and you have the betting level where you represent exchangeable betting rates. You extract the poly probability function from the belief functions. So the idea is that betting rates that people give uh, under the Bayesian approach are induced by their belief states, but uh, they are not in one-to-one -one correspondence with the belief states. Several states of knowledge may lead to the same betting rates. For instance, ignorance and randomness lead to uniform betting rates. So there's an interesting problem is to derive a betting probability from a belief function. And of course, some people would say, since we have a cradle set, you could use a max entropy, for instance. Just I mentioned this for justifying Laplace principle of indifference. But uh, I claim that entropy is very strange in that case. For instance, suppose a person assesses belief that a coin falls on heads and tails, so H and, and T respectively. And he cannot assess precise probabilities, he just have de belief degrees and expresses lower bounds. For instance, he, he could not test the, the coin. So suppose he gives the credit, the certainty for H is 0.4 and the certainty for tails is 0.1. So there are lower probabilities. So clearly indicates a preference for heads. But if you compute max entropy solution, you get 0.5 on heads and tails. So that uh, th this does not reflect at all the magnitudes of belief degrees provided by, by the, uh, the, the person that, that gave the, the, the degrees of beliefs. So max cent is, is a very strange. In any, in any case, whenever the cradle set contains the uniform distribution, max cent will always give it, while the, the, the cradle set expresses by itself expresses beliefs. So according to Smets, in order to, to, to bet uh, based on the belief function, so an agent has a state of knowledge described by a, a belief function, a, a mass function, and the agents ranks decision using expected utility. So Smets proposed to generalize Laplace principle and then does the, the following way. You, you pick an epistemic state with probability M of E, and then you select an element at random in E like using a uniform probability. And then you can compute the, the betting probability, which is a probability of obtaining a state S out of this process. And it turns out that this is well known in game theory. It is a Shapley value of the belief function. It's, and you, what you get is a center of gravity of the cradle set so that when you compare max entropy and Shapley value, Shapley value is much more convincing. On the problem of head versus tails, for instance, the one I mentioned, where you get 0 0.5, 0 0.5 for max entropy, Shapley value would give you 0 0.65 for, for heads and, and, and 0 0.35 for tail, which really reflects the difference between the, by the preference for heads given by the, by, by the person. By the way, you have the same type of uh, uh, strange behavior of max entropy uh, if you consider uh, abductive reasoning without prior. And this is a paper that I published in 2008 where you, you want to ascertain an hypothesis based on evidence E and you only know the conditional probabilities prob probability of evidence given hypothesis A and B and probability of evidence given the converse of hypothesis. So and suppose you don't have any prior on H, so you get a cradle set, which is just given by the constraints on the conditional probabilities. And the question is how to compute the posterior. 
if you compute the Shapley value, you get uh, something very unsurprising like A divided by A plus B, which is exactly what you would get starting with a uniform prior. Why max entropy, you get a very baroque uh, expression that you cannot understand why you get it really. <clears throat> so, as I said, there are clearly several belief functions with a prescribed Shapley value. Uh, and so we, in the past, we, we solved the problem of finding the least informative, uh, let's say, belief functions that, that would justify this type of betting behavior if you only get uh, the subjective uh, probability P, you can reconstruct the, uh, the belief state using a least informative uh, uh, assumption. Okay, and I switch to that. And I would just like to want to point out a last point, which is a problem of revision. Uh, I mean, when you get new information and you have these two levels, represent the level where you represent your knowledge and the level where you use a probability because you are using betting rates, suppose a new sure information is obtained. And then bet, since betting rates cannot equate it with belief states, what should do we revise? Should we condition at the cradle level and next we produce new betting rates or should we condition the previous betting rates? Okay, so this is a, the, the, the picture. So you have your state of knowledge is represented by a belief function and you have a betting probability that you will use in computing expected utility, for instance. Then you can condition up there at the cradle level and then bet again, or you can revi revise your betting uh, probabilities using uh, classical conditioning. And the interesting point is that in general, the two results are not the same. And just to give you a suggestion where you should condition, this is the example given by Philip Smets that I will recall for those who don't know it. Uh, so suppose you have a, a criminal case where you have three suspects, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and the killer was randomly selected uh, man versus woman by coin tossing. So this is all you know in order to, to guess who is the killer. So the, 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 the belief function approach, the TBM transfer for belief model propose a mass function which put one half on Peter Paul and one half on Mary because of the random selection of man versus woman. So you get that the, the, the evidence in favor of Paul and Peter individually is zero, and, but the plausibility of, 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 the, of the man is of course one half. Now, if you use a Bayesian modeling, because you don't have a preference between Peter and Paul, you would put Paul and Peter at probability one fourth and Mary at probability one half with this information. Now you get a, a new piece of information that Peter was seen elsewhere at the time of the killing. So Peter has an alibi. So pr plausibility that Peter is, 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 is guilty is zero. Then in the transferable belief model, you make the conditioning at the cradle level by just erasing Peter from the set. So you are only, remain, only remains Paul would give the one half for himself and you get Mary at one half as well. So you get a uniform probability on Paul and Mary as a result of conditioning at the cradle level. But if you, sorry, if, if you condition at the uh, betting level at, at the, with betting probabilities, then by, by Bayesian modeling, you would get that the probability of that Paul is guilty is one third and probability of Mary is, is guilty is two thirds. So we tend to put Mary in jail, which is very debatable because this is even worse than we, you, we can think of because the result of, of Peter, of Paul against Mary would depend upon where the story starts. If you start with I males and G, J females, you would get J over one plus J with a Bayesian approach. And so it could switch from Paul to, to Mary and in any case, uh, I mean, uh, in, in that particular example, it seemed that the uniform probability in the end sounds like the, the most uh, reasonable uh, result. So we should, uh, the message is that conditioning at the, uh, uh, on your knowledge is very different, give a different result and more convincing in some sense than if you are making conditioning on single probabilities you've extracted from your information. So this is what I wanted to, to say. 
and I conclude. So single property distribution do not properly represent partial ignorance. And so that, that's why uncertainty theories are needed that extend probability theory for a more faithful expressive representation of uncertainty, especially in case of partial ignorance. And moreover, modeling and measuring the impact of ignorance is useful. I mean, and especially to separate what they call aleatory and epistemic uncertainty corresponding to randomness and ignorance. Because at the end of a process, when you have propagated uncertainty, it's important to know that you don't know because you can make information collection decisions instead of making decisions that would be disastrous. If I, by just collecting more information, you would get a safer answer. And <clears throat> so uncertainty theories allows from, for classical decision criteria via, via, via betting rates induced by epistemic states. But for, the, for to do that, it seems that Shapley value it, is much, much more convincing than maximum entropy. And in any, in any case, you don't need to go back to pro single probability to, to, to make decisions. As I have shown by Ellsberg paradox, people don't always do that. And so you can use other criteria like lower expectation. And you have also generalizations of OVIX criteria to express degrees of optimism and pessimism and so forth. So that's what I wanted to say. I think I will stop. OK. Thank you so much, Didier. Um, would any, does anyone have any questions for Professor Dubois? I, I, uh, I, I, I have a, sorry, yeah. who, who, who wants to go first? OK. I think you can, you can start, Adolphus. Oh, OK. Thank you so much, Francis. So uh, first of all, thank you so much, Professor Dubois. It's a very, very uh, interesting presentation today. Um, OK, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working mainly on engineering uh, related problems in Bayesian model updating. And it's still it's a bit difficult for me to accept that the uniform probability, as you mentioned earlier, um, does not represent a lack of information because what I interpret from uniform distributions is that, you know, when you have like, when you know like, like a value can lie between any two bounds and you have no further information from there that, that you know, one, let's say a, a value within this bound is more probable than the other. And under such scenario, when you really do not know, you know um, like what the true value is, and even in everyday life, we always say that, okay, it lies between X and Y, you know, um, it could be anything in between. And I think uh, this itself, you know, which is modeled, which can be modeled by a uniform distribution. Like I still believe uh, to a large extent that it denotes a lack of information, but yeah, perhaps this will raise your eyebrows as well for sure. But uh, I, it's, how would you uh, probably like, like uh, sort of like, like convince otherwise? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I mean I, I, I gave you th three arguments for that. First, the, the, the fact that this uniform distribution, if you take it for ignorance, uh, you, you never know whether it is due to frequencies, expresses uniform frequencies or not. The third reason is that anyway, ignorance representation should be scale invariant because uh, whatever you choose as a variable, if they are equivalent variables, equivalence, they should be equivalently ignorance. But this uniform distribution on, on one representation would give you a non-uniform in the other. So, so cl clearly you get a problem. I mean, people should ac admit that ignorance means that you miss the, the, the information in some of the sense that you have one of among several possible values and that's all you have. So mm. you should run at, at the most basic uh, uh, state I mean, the, in the most basic way, you just r should run interval analysis and not mm. uniform probability distribution. I mean, I find that from ignorance to compute mm. precise probabilities in the end of computation process is very mm. strange. I mean, because if you enter uniform distributions in, in place of ignorance uh, in, a, let's say, a, a propagation process, or uncertainty propagation process, you would still get precise probabilities in the end. And this is kind of miraculous. Mm. I mean, the, the ignorance means that you don't know the probability. This is precisely what it means. 
So the okay. uniform probability, you know the probability. <laughs> but ignorance, this is precisely the case where you don't know it, especially if it's a frequentist probability. Uh, so, this is, uh, so this is why uh, I, I cannot agree with you that uniform distribution, but this is really the key point. You know, We mm -hmm. can take everything from the Bayesian theory, except that the idea is that uniform distributions represent ignorance. So this is, uh, I mean, you, and another, just to, to continue, I mean, if you put a uniform distribution where you have ignorance in the resulting computations, when you compute the variance of the output, mm -hmm. you have the part of the variance, which is due to variability, and the rest of the variance is due to ignorance. And you have, you cannot tell one from the other. You just have a single variance reflecting mm -hmm. the two. But for, for proper decisions later on, it's very important to know if the variance you obtain is due to, to, to lack of information or if the variance is due because of, of the physical phenomenon is variable. Because of course you can, you will not have the same decision. If the physical phenomenon is variable, then you have to, uh, to face the, the physical phenomenon. If the variance is due to your ignorance, you just have to collect information if you can. Mm. But if you make, but a, a, a unique probability model would mix up the two. I mean, so so this is why I, I still stick to the idea that we should, as as uh, Scott Ferson wrote already mm. in '96, we should not uh, use the same model for epistemic and aleatory uncertainty. We should distinguish it in your computations. I hope I, I I answer because these are key questions indeed. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you put it in, in the sense that ignorance is essentially meaning say, I do not even know the distribution. Yeah. Then in this context, yes, it, it, there's no dispute uh, on that part. But um, yeah, yeah uh, thank you so much for clarifying uh, this point. And uh, okay. I'll leave the time for others to ask. But thank you so much once again, Professor Dubois. Sorry to, re to reply a bit long, long but I mean, <laughs> this, we need to, to, to give arguments. Yeah. <clears throat> um, thanks, Dolphus. Uh, great question. Uh, Vladek, would you like to unmute yourself? First, I want to uh, I want to just uh, Hello, confirm Vladek. what what Didier just. Hi, how are you? Uh, I want to confirm what uh, Didier just said, and because there was an example, very nice picture by Scott last week on his talk. If you have n different, if you if your measurement error, for example, is a sum of n different components, about which all you know is each of them is, for example, from minus n from minus one to one. Then all you know about the sum, it is from minus n to n. But if you assume that they're uniformly distributed, then by the uh, central limit theorem, the result will be uh, normal distribution. So with high probability, 99.99, whatever it is percent, it's between three sigma or whatever, six sigma interval. And you get bounds which are square root of n as opposed to n, which will be absolutely misleading in practical engineering applications because of course, the title of this particular conference is engineering applications. So in this case, it's not just philosophically, it will be a practically a disaster if you assume that everything is uniform. But the question I was planning to ask is the following, because like in game theory, Shapley value is not just coming out of nowhere, it is justified by reasonable conditions that if you have a game with n players which are symmetric, then their outcome should be uniform, should be equal. And two, that if you have the two different games, basically the sum, then the value assigned to the sum of the games should be equal to the sum. Uh, is there a similar explanation for the use of Shapley value for Dempster Schaefer? Yeah, actually, the, the, this was done by Philip Smets. Oh, I think okay. when, when he did it, he did not know about the works of Shapley. So he oh, never okay. said it is Shapley value. He called that pignistic transformation. Okay, but I but see. he made a proof that this is the only way of, a, uh, 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 I mean, rational way, let's say, according to his. And I think he gave very similar properties to, to, to the one of Shapley. Mm. So, so that, uh, and, and anyway, we, we should be convinced because if you think that a credible set represents the opinion of somebody giving you lower probabilities, like, like in the coin examples I gave, I mean, so you have a credible set that really represents your beliefs, but through the lower probabilities, then Shapley value takes the, the, the center of gravity of this credible set. Mm. And this is rather convincing if what you want is to reflect 
the, the location of the cradle set, the geometrical location of the cradle set, uh, I mean, uh, taking the, the, the center of gravity is exactly, exactly doing that. But if you take max entropy, of course, you, you miss it totally. <laughs> you, 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 you find very That's strange true. results. Yep. So, I, so I would claim that uh, Shapley value is important for uncertainty as much as in game theory. Okay, thank you. I believe um, Raymundo had a, a question. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Dina. <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so my question is a little bit about operations that we do with measures uh, with probability measures or possibility measures. Um, and one very open question would be, what operations differences do you see we should have in mind when we are dealing with possibility measures instead of probability measures? What, and then- uh, Yeah, but uh, just make it precise. What, what do you mean by different operations? Like, um, when we are conditioning on events, yeah. that's my, my most precise question. Uh -huh. uh, I, I understand that there are different types of conditioning when you go with imprecise probability yeah, theory. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is an important point. Yes, I did not speak about this, of course, I could not, but yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you ask yourself about conditioning. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, actually, what happens is, is the following is that in probability theory, you just have one way of conditioning probabilities, mathematically speaking but it's used for several purposes. Because mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, if you consider a Bayesian net, for instance, okay? So Bayesian net, you can, for instance, ask a question to the Bayesian net. You say, okay, I have a patient here that has this and this disease or, or this is, let's say, temperature and these symptoms. So you, so, and then you condition on the symptoms to, to make a, a guess of the, let's say the disease of the patient based on the, uh, so you are querying the, the, in some sense, the Bayesian net. So it's a, so, but you use standard conditioning. Yeah. But another problem would be that you happen to know that some events is always true. So you would like to revise your, 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 your Bayesian net. So I, to, to make it better because you have a new information and so you condition again. So yeah. revision and querying are two Two, two tasks that are solved by Bayesian conditioning. Uh, but uh, it, when you move to uh, imprecise probabilities, including possibility of belief functions, actually uh, you, you have several ways of extending probabilistic conditioning to, to those things. That, and these ways, these, these uh, conditionings, I mean, come down to standard conditioning from probability, of course but there are different extensions. And the question is not what is the best one, is what is, what, to, what, what is the usefulness of this conditioning against this other conditioning? And for yes. instance, if you take Dempster rule of conditioning, this is very good for revision, just like in my story of Peter, Paul and Mary. But if you would like to query, let's say a, 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 an imprecise Bayesian network, like a cradle network, say, as, as they say, then you cannot use Dempster rule at all. Dempster rule is for rev revision. You, what you would like to do then is to take the set of conditional probabilities in the cradle set and take the upper and lower conditional probabilities. And this would give you, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the reply to, to your, your, your query. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, it's the same problem as for Bayesian net, you have symptoms and you condition the symptoms to know the disease, but you condition by um, computing, let's say sensitivity analysis on, on, on the, on, on the um, uh, conditional probability. And this is another conditioning that has been proposed by Peter Wally, for instance, and also by uh, uh, Joe Alpern that you, you can find. It's another way of conditioning and one is good for, for querying, the other is good for revision. And so this, you have to be very careful to understand what the conditioning you are trying to make means. Is it, mm -hmm. are you do, doing a revision? Are you doing a, just wanting to focus the, the, your knowledge on, on, 
the 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 set of uh, uh, I, I mean uh, on, on on the part of the universe uh, that, that corresponds to to your information, and so you want to the condition of that. What what happens if uh, I, I am in this area? This is not revision. This is querying, and so mm -hmm. indeed you. But I would mean that that. Uh, con Talk about conditioning would take another hour, actually. So I stop here. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, but thank you very much for the answer. Okay, I think we have time for for one more question. I'm a little bit ignorant as to whether. Sorry, I'm really I'm question. sorry to, to 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 slow, but this is not easy to answer right away on conditioning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have time for one more question. I'm a little bit torn between Bill and uh, Dominic. There's some debate about the the, the Monty uh, the Monty Hall problem, oh. um, and and Bill has one. So I'm ignorant whether it's 50 50, um, and maybe I'm just too ignorant to make a choice. But I think there's a lot of people talking about Dominic's question in the chat. So would you like to unmute yourself, uh, Dominic Hose? Um, sure, uh, but I think. Bill was first, so if Hello, you... Dominique. <laughs> hi, hi, Didier. Um, thank you for your talk. So um, my question was, the, the last um, example that you posed um, with the, the murder, Peter, Paul, and Mary, yeah. kind of reminded me of the Monty Hall um, game show problem, where you can yeah. either win uh, one of two goats or a sports car. And I was just wondering, if the solution to that problem would be different in the IP framework, I'm not sure if you're maybe I'm not. With I, I'm, I, I, Montiol is long time ago, and I'm not sure to understand to 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 remember it very properly and to solve it right away. But what? But I, it seems that it's not exactly the same case anyway, because yeah, so uh, I mean, in some sense, in this Montiol problem, you open a, a door and there is a goat or not or something like that. This type of thing you can do several times if you want to test. So if you play this game several times, maybe you you get some uh, well, say frequentist type of a view of that problem. I mean, to to go back to the problem I was dealing with, this is really a problem with unique events, right? Because this was there was a murder. It's a unique event. You want to know who is uh, the the guilty person, and you 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 know that somebody has an alibi. So we are really, really revising subjective probabilities here, okay? But uh, if you assume that you put this type of problems like a sociological uh, uh, inquiry uh, about the behaviors of men and women concerning this type of murder or something like that, this type of uh, events, then the, 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 probably you, we should use a different approach to that because uh, if let's say Peter represents rich men, uh, rich males, uh, Paul represents poor males, and uh, Mary represents women at large, uh, there's, and, and you pose a problem like uh, uh, a, pro a socio sociological study, then it's not clear that we should reason in the same way. And I think that for the Montiel problem, but it's a long, long time ago, I will not be able to to solve it right away, but if you send me the reference to that problem, I will I will send you a, my my opinion more precisely when I can study it. The, so, so the question I had was I think kind of different because I I was basically asking which I yeah um, that if you have a finite and countable universe of discourse, if it's then okay to have a unif like which can be subdivided any further. Obviously, for the Mars life or no life problem, you can always subdivide that. But yeah. for the Monty Hall problem, you have three basic outcomes, right? Yeah. Um, so the question was then if that would would justify a uniform prior. Um, but that's so yeah, the question was really if if for countable and finite universes of discourse, a uniform. Ah, uh, countable versus uh, finite. Yeah. yeah, but actually, the it is clear that you cannot define a uniform probability on on a countable uh, set. I mean, if a set takes a real number, no, no, the the integers, positive integers. You you have no uh, uniform possible probability on it. It's no pro it's not possible to do it. So what people do, uh, 
the only solution I have seen about that is people fr from the Definiti school that they, they, they express the fact uh, that, that the, the conditional probability uh, on, on the, the uh, on the set of integers for, for each subset of integer you, you you define a conditional probability and this you can do but uh, but usually, uh, I mean, the, the mathematical way, mathematically, you cannot define a uniform distribution on, on the, the set of integers. This is not possible. So, no. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for all your questions. And let's thank our speaker again. So thank you very much, Didier. Um, OK. And sorry, Bill, that we didn't get a chance to, to address your question, but hopefully we get a chance to to talk about it in the open discussion. Um, so I'd just like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Laura Swyler. Um, she'll be talking to us about epistemic uncertainty, computation and usage. So Dr. Laura Swyler is a computational scientist whose research focuses on quantifying uncertainty associated with predictions from computational models. Her research addresses the question, how much can we infer from as few models runs as possible? given the high cost of running advanced science and engineering models. Particular research areas include experimental design, adaptive sampling algorithms, Bayesian inference, model calibration, and Gaussian process surrogate models. So Dr. Swyler uh, has been a staff member at San Diego Lab, National Labs for 26 years. So she has a lot of experience. I'm really excited to hear what she has to say. Um, so would you like to start sharing your screen, uh, Laura, and you can, you can start your presentation. Yes, I will. Let's see. Um, Great. We can we can see the PowerPoint. And, and that's in full too. screen mode. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much, uh, Scott and Francis, for inviting me to this seminar series uh, today. I do want to talk about the, the calculus of, of epistemic uh, uncertainty calculations. And so um, that I, I will focus on, on uh, computational issues. And just a quick outline of my talk, I'll, I'll give some definitions and then uh, we'll, I will talk about these computational issues. And I want to finish with a little bit of history about uncertainty, quantification and sensitivity analysis in uh, our nuclear waste repository analysis, but more generally it's in, with some of the big probabilistic risk assessments that um, um, institutions like, like national laboratories you know, work on for nuclear reactors and for, for weapon systems. And so a little bit of why we tend to think about epistemic and aleatory uncertainty in the way that we do. Um, I have to give the caveat, um, this talk really is um, biased to approaches that we have developed at Sandia and, and in the national labs, and it reflects my personal experiences. I am a member of the software team, uh, the Dakota software team. Dakota is a, a software tool that, that will have all these calculation methods I'm talking about today. It is not a Dakota talk, but I, I did want to mention that, that um, being on the Dakota team has certainly um, um, you know, colored my experiences and, and um, if, if you're interested in any of these methods and want to talk further, I'm, I'm happy to do that. For this community, I do not have to go, I'll go over the definition slides very fast. Um, we will just consider, um, and, and also this is not um, a philosophical talk. I am assuming that you have some um, uncertain variables uh, defined either as epistemic or aleatory variables. And that's sort of, you figured that out and, and you uh, have this distinction. So epistemic uncertainty, the lack of knowledge uncertainty, and in particular with respect to engineering um, model computations, you know, an example might be um, we are we don't know the elastic modulus for a material for a specific component. Um, uh, and, and so that presumably is fixed, but we don't know the for that particular component, but we don't know the particular value. 
and then aleatory uncertainty in inherent uh, variability and uh, sometimes also called irreducible uncertainty. So, so again, we're assuming we have this uh, split. And again, this terminology, I don't need to, I think, really um, spend a lot of time with, with this uh, audience. I did want to mention that the um, there's a little bit of difference in the research communities focused who are focused on sensitivity analysis versus uncertainty quantification. So one can use an ensemble of sample results, for example, to do both. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But in the last 10 or 20 years, I would say the sensitivity analysis community has focused a lot on the variance-based decomposition me measures like SOBOL indices, and now they're going beyond variance measures to density measures and information theoretic uh, sensitivity analysis. The uncertainty quantification community in the last 20 years has focused a lot on these stochastic expansion methods, polynomial chaos, for example, and now more recently on these multi-fidelity or multi-level EQ methods. So I see a little bit of divergence in, in the research directions. Um, so, so I just wanted to highlight that. So what do I mean when I talk about uncertainty quantification? Um, Really, the goal here is to account for both epistemic and aleatory uncertainty when we run our computational simulations. And so today I'll be talking mostly about what, what we call forward UQ propagating uncertainty and in input parameters through a simulation model to obtain statistics on the corresponding output or responses um, where that output is, is a function of our uh, input uncertainty. There um, is you know, the, the, the other direction, which is sometimes called um, inverse UQ, where you take observational data and, and then you want to infer what were the corresponding input distributions, which, which would give rise to that kind of um, experimental or upstream model variation, but I'm not, I'm not going to be really focusing on, on inverse UQ today. It'll be forward UQ. So, so let's jump in then to the computational aspects. So I'm going to talk about three, um, three methods for propagating epistemic uncertainty, interval analysis, Dempster-Shafer evidence theory, and probability theory. So with interval analysis, we are assuming that an epistemic variable falls anywhere within an interval, but there is not an assumption of a uniform distribution here. We're just simply assuming that any realization of that variable value within an interval is a possible realization. With dempster schafer theory, we would model an epistemic variable with a set of in intervals over which a belief structure holds. And then with probability theory, of course, we model the epistemic variable with a probability distribution. And as, as you, you know, one way to think about this categorization is as you go from interval analysis to the dempster schafer to probability theory, you're making increasing assumptions about the structure of the epistemic uncertainty. So to start with the um, calculations for interval analysis, um, it's pretty straightforward. We want to specify intervals on epistemic inputs and then determine the resulting interval on the output. And so um, there are many analytic frameworks, um, interval arithmetic, Professor Krajinovich talked about Kausher arithmetic, um, Scott Fearson has uh, developed a software tool um, with the Ramas um, in software tool that, that does these calculations. Uh, but in practice, a lot of our big simulations are, are not amenable to um, you know, analytic calculations. So what are the options? Well, we can sample from these input intervals and then obtain samples of our outputs. Um, and with the, those samples, the output, we can look at the, you know, we can order this, the resulting output samples and take the minimum and maximum. 
Or we can take some initial samples over an input space, construct surrogate models, and then it's with the surrogate models, we can afford you know, to, to uh, put millions of samples on the surrogate, and then again, look at the minimum and maximum um, values to, that would correspond to the upper and lower bounds on our output. And then finally, we can use optimization methods. So we have local gradient-based optimization methods, which are very efficient and uh, very, very accurate, but these do require derivatives. So you have to have accurate derivatives of your simulation model. There are also global optimization methods. These are usually gradient-free, but require many function evaluations. So you've probably heard of things like evolutionary algorithms, like genetic algorithms, where you're evolving a population of solutions over some number of generations. So those kind of methods do are, are more um, costly computationally. Then there are hybrid methods, and we often use hybrid methods where we, we employ a a global me optimization method like a GA or a pattern search in for some number of function evaluations, then we just stop it. We take the best solution we have thus far and then kick in a local gradient-based optimization method. And then finally, surrogate methods can be used with either local or and or, or global methods, optimization methods. So, um, to, to be a little bit more specific here, when we're looking at uncertainty quantification with, with intervals, you need to translate the UQ problem into two optimization problems. One is to minimize, to find the minimum of the response, and the other is to find the maximum of the response. Um, where you want to find the minimum over all values of the uncertain parameters where the uncertain parameters are defined on, on these bounded intervals. So, so again here, um, just, just to, to emphasize, we're looking at the forward UQ problem where we have uncertainty on input variables U that are defined by intervals and we're trying to you know, efficiently um, figure out how we're going to sample these, these intervals, run them through the simulation model to determine our interval on, on the output. And if we use optimization methods, then we have to solve these two optimization problems. So here's a very simple example. And this was taken from the um, challenge, one of the challenge problems that um, Bill Overcamp and, and John, John Helton and Scott and others uh, did in the early 2000s, it's a very simple problem. Y equals A plus B to the A. And for, for this problem, I'm defining both A and B between point one and one. And so we've, we've got the truth result. And then here are the corresponding um, estimates of the lower and upper bounds on Y that you would obtain if you were only able to run, for example, 10 Latin hypercube samples. So it's not really very good. And then even a hundred and a thousand uh, LHS samples, you know, you certainly can see that, that you're starting to hone in on those bounds. Um, but, but again, even with a thousand LHS samples, the upper bound is two. And, and here we are at 1.94. Uh, we also then ran some optimization methods on this problem. Now, this is an analytic problem. It's only two variables. You know, it's, it's very amenable to optimization. But I just wanted to show the savings that can be achieved. This first optimization method is called EGO. That's efficient global optimization. It's an adaptive Gaussian process-based optimization. So you start with a GP based only on a few samples, and then you, you adapt it where the adapt, adaptation um, is in areas where you don't have a lot of samples, there's a high prediction variance, and also in regions of the space where the algorithm is honing in on the optimal value. So you may, may have heard of this exploration versus exploitation trade-off. And so that's what this ego algorithm does. And with only 15 samples, and remember, this, this, the, this Gaussian process uh, surrogate is being used for two optimizations, the, the minimum this, to find the lower bound and the maximum. You know, again, we're, we're getting pretty good estimates of, of the bounds. 
This next optimization algorithm, a surrogate-based optimization algorithm, also uses a Gaussian process surrogate, but it is not an ad adaptive surrogate. It uses an evolutionary algorithm based on a fixed GP. It only required 17 samples, and again, very accurate estimates of the bound. And then finally, this last row is um, an evolutionary algorithm not run on any um, with any surrogates, just on the function itself. And so you can see. Um, if we were to treat these parameters as uniforms and just look at the resulting CDF, that's given in the, in the blue line. And then I'm showing, if you want to call these probability boxes given by these, these interval estimates from the 10 LHS samples in orange, the 1,000 LHS samples in purple, and then um, I just show one of the surrogate based methods. They're pretty much overlapping um, in the green. So you, you can see, again, we want to get, you know, accurate estimates of this, these bounds with as few function evaluations as possible. And optimization is one way to do that. So moving on to from interval analysis to Dempster Schaefer theory. Um, um, again, I'm sure this community is very familiar with, with Dempster Schaefer evidence theory. And um, um, Professor Didier, before me, talked a, a, a little bit about this. Um, we have this concept of Dempster Schaefer belief structures. And so for each input variable, one specifies um, a number of intervals and assigns a basic probability uh, to each. So for this first variable, I have three intervals here. The intervals may be overlapping. Um, they can be contiguous, but they don't have to be. They can have gaps. And, and here is just a, a, you know, a notional example with, with three um, basic probability assignments. And, and here's a um, you know, different example for the second variable. So when we have these, um, this belief structure defined, then the belief is the lower bound on the probability consistent with the evidence and plausibility is the upper bound consistent with the evidence. Well, how do we, how do we take a belief structure on inputs to a computational simulation and get the belief and plausibility on the responses? That is an expensive operation. What happens is you end up having to examine all combinations of intervals. So here is a simple two-dimensional problem where you've got variable one on the x-axis, variable two on the y-axis. And here I did make the intervals um, contiguous and, and I show the basic probability assignments. And here um, is, again, it's a simple example. I'm assuming that each interval has excuse me, each variable is defined by three intervals. So we have nine interval combinations. These, each combination is called a focal element or, or a cell here. And to, to do this computation, you have to find the minimum and maximum value of your response in each of these cells. So now I've, you know, <laughs> now I've got a, right, a, a problem of, Instead of doing two optimizations for this problem, I have to do 18 optimizations if, if I use optimization. So how can you atta attack this? Well, if, you're, you know, if your simulation is really cheap, <laughs> you can um, just run a million samples and then look at the samples that fall within each interval, calculate, you know, figure out which are the min and max uh, values, and, and then those are rolled up to the overall belief and plausibility. If you can't do that and you can only afford a few, as I've shown here, um, you know, maybe you do some Latin hypercube sampling over the entire space, then you might want to construct a surrogate model. And for, with each, with the surrogate model, then you can, again, blast it with a million points and, and look at, say, um, the surrogate points, as I've shown with the red triangles, and, and look at the minimum and maximum values that the surrogate is, is giving you. And, and then finally, um, you can use an optimization approach where, again, you're doing two optimization in each um, combination of the focal elements for the dempster shaper um, problem. So what do you get from this? Um, you will get 
cumulative belief and plausibility functions or complementary uh, uh, cumulative belief and plausibility functions that would you know, bound our, our true and unknown CDF or, or CCDF. And so these, these um, C complementary belief and, uh, excuse me, cumulative belief and plausibility functions tend to have a st this stair-stepped approach where each step in the stair corresponds to, you know, another um, amount of belief or plausibility from a particular focal element. So the final, um, the final approach that I want to talk about for modeling epistemic uncertainty is, is just our, our classical probability theory. And one can um, you know, use many approaches to um, propagate uncertainty. The most common by far is sampling. So Monte Carlo sampling, uh, Latin hypercube sampling, which is a stratified sampling method, quasi Monte Carlo methods like um, Hammersley, Halton, or Niederreiter sequences, uh, good space filling designs, advantages of sampling methods, they're robust, they're understandable, easy to propagate, um, but they're slow to converge. You get one over square root and convergence rate. And uh, from sampling, you can get, you know, estimate moments of your response, uh, PDFs, CDFs, correlations between your response and, and input parameters, and, and also min and max values. The other two methods that I'm highlighting here really have been developed to reduce those numbers of function evaluations. Um, we don't want to have to run thousands of Monte Carlo sample through, samples through an expensive simulation code. And so stochastic expansions um, have, have become very popular in the computational science community. These are, you can think of these sort of as surrogate models tailored for doing um, UQ and primarily on continuous variables. There are some discrete extensions, but, but mostly continuous. And they're similar to a regression model, but they have they use basis functions that are orthogonal polynomials chosen to be orthogonal to the input uncertainty distribution. So we use Hermit polynomials for a normal distribution. We use Legendre for a uniform distribution, we use Jacobi for beta, and there's a whole family of, of these orthogonal polynomials. They're very efficient for smooth model responses. And again, they'll give you things like moments and um, the C CDFs and, and also the Sobol indices. Um, finally, there are reliability methods. Um, Luis Crespo talked a little bit about these in his talk, um, things like form and SORM first order and second order reliability. These are goal oriented. So you don't get the whole CDF. You, you will get say the probability that the uh, response is less than a particular threshold value. So, so they're focused on accurate estimates of, of percentiles or particular response levels. And again, this is one of these methods that involves a transformation of the uncertainty problem to an optimization problem. And so under the hood, um, you have to do use an optimization and you can use local and global methods. So let's put all this together. I've talked about three approaches to treat epistemic uncertainty, just in terms of the actual calculations of, of running um, these different representations through a computational model. Now I want to talk about mixed problems where we have a combination of epistemic and aleatory uncertainty. And so, um, you know, the, the somebody trying to do this could choose one of the three methods from to, tr to handle epistemic uncertainty. And then we always use probability theory to represent aleatory uncertainty. So, um, Again, Professor, Professor Krinovich talked about you know, people wanting a recipe and it's sort of like, well, you can choose one from the menu of epistemic uh, uncertainties and, and then you have probability theory for, for the aleatory. I, just a few other notes. If you choose um, to represent your epistemic uncertainty with probability, this combination of probability theory for both epistemic and aleatory is called second order probability or probability of frequency. 
I honestly don't like either of these terms. Second order probability, I think, is misleading. There's no quadratic uh, approximations going on here. Um, it, it just means uncertainty on uncertainty. And so this little example I have at the bottom, you know, say you have an aleatory variable distributed as normal with mean A, standard deviation B. But if you don't know what the mean or the standard deviation is, uh, then you may treat A and B as epistemic variables defined by intervals or belief structures or with a probability distribution. So that's what this, this uncertainty on the uncertainty uh, can, can refer to. So how do we, again, from the computational side, how do we do this? Um, here's an example of one thing that we do with second order probability. We separate out the epistemic and aleatory uncertainties, and we do a nested sampling. So we may, and it doesn't really matter what order you do, but I'm showing um, we have an outer loop where we're um, sampling the epistemic parameters and then an inner loop where we're sampling the aleatory parameters. So uh, how this uh, works operationally, we choose one value of an epistemic parameter. Perhaps we treat the, the mean of a normal, uh, as my example in the previous page, that, that variable A, we pick one possible realization of, of A, then conditional on that realization, we, and also of B, conditional on those realizations of A and B, we've got a normal with an actual mean and, and uh, variance defined. And so we can generate 100 samples of that particular normal distribution. And that will create one of the CDF curves in this plot on the right. Then we go back and we pick another value of those epistemic uh, parameters and then substitute it into our inner loop. And then we get another CDF. And in this way, if we you know, do some number of outer loop samples and some number of inner loop samples, we get this whole ensemble of CDF curves where the envelope would, would represent our overall response uncertainty. So um, again, in a little bit more detail, the, this is the, the nested sampling I just spoke of is the traditional approach for mixed epistemic and aleatory problems. Um, one issue with it is for expensive simulations, we are likely to um, have under-resolved sampling. Often we may be only able to afford 10 or 20 samples in that outer loop. And, um, and that can be, as you saw with my the little simple ex interval example, that may quite under-resolve the bounds. The, um, and, and so we've talked about different algorithmic approaches for interval value probability or dempster shaper or the second order probability. And so what we're, we still are going to be, you know, primarily look, looking at using a nested structure, but instead of sampling, we want to replace sampling with, um, for example, if you're using interval analysis on the epistemic uh, loop, we want to replace sampling with maybe an optimization. And then on the inner loop, we want to maybe perhaps replace sampling with something like a stochastic expansion method. So um, again, we we're looking at trying to not use a plain Monte Carlo sampling for both of these uh, loops because of the computational cost. Again, I've, I've mentioned this, but, but nested sampling is very expensive. And so here with this new approach, we, you know, again, to get a little bit more concrete, if we assume interval intervals for our epistemic treatment, epistemic uncertainty treatment, then that will mean we want to determine an interval on a moment such as the mean or variance. So this can be posed as a global optimization problem. So when we had all epistemic that I talked about previously and we were doing that interval optimization, that was easy. That was just, you know, find the min and max of the, the response. Now we have 
two, again, two optimization problems, but the optimization problem is a little bit more complicated. It involves, for example, finding the minimum of a statistic of the response where the response, th this minimum is over all, you know, we're trying to search over all of our epistemic parameters. And then the statistic is the response where we're varying our aleatory uh, uncertainties conditioned on those epistemic parameters. So again, the epistemic parameters for this example are being defined with bounds and um, the aleatory parameters would be de defined with particular uh, probability distributions. So we've made that optimization problem a little bit more complicated because we're doing a nested uh, problem here, but this itself, we got two optimization problems and we can employ um, the power of optimization to solve it. And one advantage um, when we use stochastic expansions, you get explicit representations of the moments as a function of those coefficients of your polynomial. So there's a lot of mathematics under the hood. I'm not going into all of it here, but you get really nice properties. If your inner loop is a not sampling, it's a stochastic expansion, you can really get efficiencies. So I'm going to show a quick example here. Um, this is a, a mechanics problem. Uh, it, it's a short column. It's called the short column problem, heavily used in reliability analysis. We've got a beam that has a rectangular cross section uh, defined by a width V and, and depth. And there's some uncertain, excuse me, some uncertain material properties. You see, see all the uncertain parameters in this table. We've defined the um, width and depth of the beam as epistemic parameters, but the other parameters as aleatory. And we have our limit state function uh, defined here as G of U. And we're really only interested in this problem in two quantities, the area, which is only a function of epistemic parameters. And then we're defining something as this, this reliability index. Again, this is heavily used in the form and SORM uh, community, but um, for a particular response Z, it, you can think of this as, you know, sort of a normalized um, distance of how far away you are from, from the mean uh, value. And so, so this reliability index is, again, often, often used in, in uh, as sort of a measure of, of uncertainty. This problem and all the results I'm going to be showing on the next couple pages is documented in this uh, reliability engineering and system safety article from about 10 years ago. So I apologize. This is really, really an eye chart. Um, uh, my colleague, Mike Eldred, um, wanted, he really wanted to examine all possible combinations of treating this epistemic aleatory problem. But the, the main takeaway I want you to, to get, if you look at the first two columns, we looked at different ways of treating the interval uh, estimation approach. So we looked at this ego, remember that was the Gaussian process surrogate model, NPSOL is a local optimization problem. And then we just looked at a few di different um, LHS sample sizes. Then, so, so this outer, this first column is how we treated the epistemic uncertainty problem. The second column is how we treated the inner loop um, aleatory problem. And this PCE refers to polynomial chaos expansions, those stochastic expansions I mentioned. And this SSG is a sparse grid method um, that we use to generate the, the sample points over which we calculate the coefficients of the expansion. Um, and there's just different orders of these sparse grids. Um, and um, th there's another subtle point. I don't really have time to go into a lot of detail here, but you can construct this, the expansion over the aleatory variables or over both aleatory and epistemic parameters. And then finally, um, this middle column shows the number of function evaluations and the number of gradient evaluations. And so, um, 
I think that you know the main takeaway here, if we look back on the previous page, the um, the, the propagation of the epistemic uncertainty is is relatively easy, right? We 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 know the um, B is is defined as five and fifteen, and and so the and H as between fifteen and twenty five, and so we know that the bounds on the area will be between um, seventy five and three seventy five, and um, so so again, if you look at the very bottom, all these LHS uh, combinations, even when we get you know there's ten thousand. Um, and, and up to um, 10 million and uh, 10 billion, they're still not exactly nailing the bounds on the epistemic uh, uncertainty. And then the, the, also the bounds, the upper and lower bounds on this beta coefficient that defines our reliability um, also varies greatly. And um, in, in the paper, Mike was looking at convergence of um, these various PCE approximations with, of different orders. So the colors repre represent um, the converged solutions for, for different orders. So, so again, I, I don't, there's, there's more details in the paper, but I really want you to take away, you know, if we look at, for example, some of these that only use, um, you know, 372 function evaluations, uh, 400, you know, maybe on the order of 800 evaluations total versus 10 billion, that's a big difference. And, and we really can get better um, with, with using some of these advanced methods. Here's the corresponding um, um, uh, solutions for when we, instead of treating the epistemic uncertainty as intervals, we treat it uh, as probability distributions. Then we actually get, um, you know, the uncertainty uh, on our, um, on distributions of our response. And so for the area, we, we want to understand what are the, what's the mean and variance of that. And again, if you, if you look down, we, it, it's, you can nail it with um, these stochastic expansions and in, in hundreds of evaluations versus millions. And then finally, we looked at um, dempster shafer belief structures and doing that, you know, I showed you the, the picture of, um, are, are we using sampling um, or, or optimization? And so we, we looked at, the, you know, the, the green lines are the corresponding um, uh, complementary belief and plausibility intervals when we take um, 100 LHS on the, epistemic and 100 LHS samples for the aleatory, and, and then we go up to 1,000. And you can see as you go to more LHS samples, you're, you're um, increasing the estimates of your bounds, but you still do much better if you can use this global optimization with the stochastic expansion. It's not so cheap. I mean, Dempster Schaefer is expensive, and, and we were using on the order of um, almost 8,000 but it's still, again, so much better than the millions uh, with sampling. So I am answering the question that um, Scott originally posed. I, do, do epistemic and aleatory uncertainty need different calculi? And my answer is no, we don't need different calculi. Um, we can treat epistemic uncertainty with, with interval arithmetic, with dempster shaver theory or probability distributions and, and many other things. I'm only focusing on these three, but what we have ways that we can, we can you know, propagate th these kinds of uncertainties, but mixed aleatory problems are very expensive and we do need to go to utilize methods to make this more efficient and go beyond nested sampling. And so I am advocating you know, the use of surrogate models the use of these polynomial chaos expansions and optimization methods. Francis, how am I doing on time? I'm a little slow. I you still got four minutes, uh, otherwise, and then 20 minutes of questions. So you have plenty of time. Okay. Um, it might take a little bit more than, than four minutes, but. Um, no problem. So, so why, why do we care about the separation? Um, well, one reason is we, you know, hopefully we can invest in reducing our um, 
the uncertainty for, for epistemic uncertainty through experimentation or better understanding. Um, I'm going to skip this part. I, I, I will jump right into the, um, the, the early work. Where, where, where did some of this, this thinking about separation uh, of uncertainties come from? There's a very famous study called the WASH 1400 study. It was the first major study of reactor safety that was very, um, you know, sort of a the very quantitative and demonstrated the formal use of probabilistic risk assessment at scale, very large scale. Uh, they had fault trees and event trees, and um, it was really an extensive documentation, um, identification of paths, for example, for loss of coolant accidents, the LOCAs. Um, it was, it, this was in the mid 70s. This was really the a major um, advancement in the use of PRAs for regulatory um, requirements. But then there was a critique of that, the Lewis report, which said, you know, we, you did great on the, the method and using these formal um, probabilistic methods, but the actual numbers that you had, we, we are not happy with that. You didn't do a thorough enough treatment of uncertainties. And, and so, you know, they felt, for example, that you know, you've got a big fall tree and you've got, you know, base, uh, say failure probabilities of valves and different components, and you roll that all up to probability of a core meltdown. They didn't want just one estimate of the probability of core meltdown. They wanted a distribution of that. And so then you need to have distributions on your failure probabilities of your basic events. And so this notion of uncertainties on uncertainties or uncertainties. Be, really becomes prevalent. And then we carried that to, to our uh, waste repository analysis. And so, and I have all these references. I, I am happy to send out the slides to, to uh, anyone. Um, there's just a lot of great references. Um, Sandia was the lead lab for the license applications, both for the waste isolation pilot plant and Yucca Mountain. And so um, we have lots of documentation about how we treated epistemic and aleatory uncertainties. But again, it was this, this explicitory, excuse me, explicit separation in both um, WIP and Yucca Mountain. And um, John Helton has written some really nice uh, overview special issues in, in RES that um, go into lots of detail about the waste repository analyses. Um, and again, as, as I have mentioned, we have always at Sandia had an explicit, a focus on explicit separation per these regulatory requirements. And, and I've mentioned the different things that we have examined for epistemic uncertainty. And um, there's a wonderful SAND report that goes into um, extensive mathematical uh, foundations for, for all of these different uh, approaches. So finally, um, again, just to be trace the evolution of um, how we have thought about um, uncertainty for big evaluations. Um, I've talked about reactor safety, waste repository assessment, and in the weapons program, we had this initiative called Quantifications of Margins and Uncertainties, QMU, um, at, in the tri-labs. And this, this program got formal reviews by the National Academy of Sciences and the JSONs. And there's a nice booklet that the National Academy published um, that evaluates this approach. And I think some of these takeaways are, are interesting. Um, you know, it's a sound and valuable framework, but then it says, while they focus much attention on UQ, a broader effort is needed, further development of the methodology to identify, aggregate, and propagate uncertainties. And then the National Academy also felt these last two bullets here, that it was important to pay to attention to the distinction from uncertainties arising from incomplete knowledge versus device to device variation, and that we should continue to focus our attention on quantifying uns uncertainties from, from all of these things, poorly modeled phenomena, numerical errors, coding errors, and, and systematic uncertainties. 
So just to give you a quick sense of um, how, how big these analyses are, this is, um, this is you know, old data, and many of you may have seen this, but this was from WIP, which is a uh, operating facility near Carlsbad, uh, New Mexico, where we have uh, transuranic radionuclide waste buried in salt caverns about 2,000 feet below the surface. Um, it, as shown in this picture, and you, as you can see, there's all sorts of um, pathways. Um, there's pressurized brine, and and um, and there's you know there's an access shaft, so so that could be a pathway to the environment. And then we have to worry, you know, some number of 10,000 years in the future, if somebody digs a borehole and and you know pierces this <laughs> um, the site, what would what would happen? And so. There are many codes, all these different codes um, are outlined here. So we had about 10 uh, computational codes that all did part of this calculation. And our job is to you know, provide a reasonable expectation that cumulative radionuclide releases 10,000 years in the future at the boundary of the site will be less than the EPA specified limits. That's a big, you know, that's a tall order. And um, what we did is, basically this nested sampling I described for um, all of these particular release modes, cutting and cavings and spalling, direct brine releases, and each one had its, you know, its own regulatory limits and, and again, documented in this risk analysis um, journal. But, um, and there's similar things for, for Yucca. Um, I, I don't wanna uh, spend a lot, lot more time, but to give you a sense of where we are now, um, um, we, we are looking at generic repositories now in, in crystalline rock. So this is not an actual site, but we're you know, still developing our, our methodology. And the, um, of course the computational models are much better than they were 20 and 30 years ago. And so one thing that we're really starting to look at is characterizing spatial heterogeneity at the site. And we do this with these discrete fracture networks. So the picture on the right here, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a waste panel um, where my, I don't know if you can see my mouse. No, you can't probably. It's, um, it's on the um, uh, left side. It's a, sort of a rectangular thing. Yeah, we that's see where we, the, the mouse, yeah. Thank you can you see, much. okay. So that's where the waste is stored. Um, but then we generate this, what you're seeing with, with all these fracture planes by sampling um, plane orientation and radius of the fracture. And there's a whole, uh, LANL has a code called BFN works that, that gives us these fracture networks. And so we've set up a sampling where our outer loop is, we've generated 20 of these. Each one is I think a five or 6 million element, you know, finite element model. Again, really, really complicated, but we want to separate that spatial heterogeneity with some of these um, epistemic parameters like uh, permeabilities and porosities. Uh, lots of quantities of interest mean travel time, mean residence time um, in the repository. And just to give you a, a sense of what we're trying to get from this, here is a realization of all of these different um, CDFs where each CDF is a different discrete fracture network. And so this allows us to say, for example, this is um, peak iodine concentration. Um, it, you know, if the, the uncertainty from these different spatial um, realizations is about two orders of magnitude. And, and that's also about the same as the uncertainty that each, each one has with respect to the epistemic uncertainty. And so, so you know, we're, we're now going back and trying to look at how do we use this, how do we reduce this large spatial uncertainty into a number? We, we, we can you know, sample one through 20, but when we do sensitivity analysis and things, that, that has to be a meaningful quantity. So we're looking at using underlying graph statistics 
the, the representation of this discrete fracture network is actually a graph. So we can use things like degree centrality, um, number of intersection paths, fracture paths that go from the re repository to the aquifer. And there's a lot of stuff that we can extract to be able to characterize the DFN. So it's not just a number one through you know, 20 and, that we use in our computation, but that we can use then for subsequent sensitivity analysis. So I'll stop there. I went over a little, I apologize, but I wanted to give you a sense of, you know, we're still really thinking in this uh, decoupled uh, way of trying to um, separate the relevant un uncertainties and, and treat those um, differently. So with that, I'll, um, I'll end. And again, I think at the end, I've got a couple more pages of references if you're interested in, in these, this recent work with the discrete fracture networks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Uh, excellent presentation. I'll be sure to upload the slides as well if people want to check out those references um, later after the talk. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat. I think there's a few uh, people clapping their hands, but also Nick, I think, was the first one to, uh, to raise their hand for a question. So would you like to unmute yourself? Nick Gray, if you're still around. You're talking about me. I, I didn't know my hand was raised. Sorry. I'll lower it. I must <laughs> okay, press no the problem. Button. So did, did you not have a question then? No, sorry. <laughs> okay. I think uh, Dominic raised his hand at one point as well. I did, but the question that I did have was answered later on, so I don't need to worry about that. But I will ask a more general question, if that's all right, please, Laura. So at, at the end, I think you, you touched on some of the problems that, that we're beginning to find, where now computational resources are such that we can actually run pretty complicated models across large machines. And, deal, and, and, and now you run into the issue of dealing with metrics of high dimensional space and, and weird, weird problems that you encounter in that kind of domain. The earlier part of your talk got me thinking about where we're actually at with algorithms, algorithm development, and how much of that's percolating into different industries and how much is being used in practice. So a lot of the methodologies that, that you described, I've, I've seen even advances on top of them done by my colleagues in Liverpool and, and, and all the round in academia. But I don't see many of those methodologies being applied um, to, in practical applications. So I wonder what you think are the approaches that are most attractive for industrial applications and what we need to do to improve our, uh, either the dissemination of our um, algorithms for dealing with uncertainty and approaches to deal with uncertainty for, uh, for people in, the, in, in applied fields. Um. So, so I agree with your observation that um, much of what I described in terms of optimization and surrogate models and use of stochastic expansions is not being used. Um, I, uh, how, how do we, and, and, and there are a couple of reasons. I think people understand sampling. It's, you, you know, it's, it's very comfortable, um, you know, and there's more work with these other, you know, to at least to get set up, but it, you get huge uh, evaluation savings. But um, I, I honestly think it's an education uh, thing. We, we have to be more comfortable tr trying these methods. There's certainly critiques. I mean, um, the surrogates can be lousy and you, you have to do due diligence and show that your, your surrogates are adequate um, and, and that your optimization methods are, um, you know, properly implemented and, and uh, converging properly in, in those things. So I, I think it's an education thing, um, but, but I do, especially with interval analysis, we can get so much, you know, the, the bound estimates can be so much better with optimization. I think that's probably the place to start because it's, um, I think it's, you know, and people can understand that this is an optimization problem really. I think uh, Vadik maybe wanted to make a point to add to that too. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yes, so uh, thank you very much for the very good presentation because it's kind of, it's just want to praise it because it's amazing because now we talk about uh, general algorithms and illustrate on very simple naive problems and Laura 
pointed out very correctly that in real life, problems are not that simple and you need to think about computational complexity as well. My question is, uh, what do you think about P-Box methods? Because uh, that's kind of, uh, I know it's not universal, it's not general, but it seems to work well in many cases. And that's also one of the ways to combine probability and interval uncertainty to deal with this, what you don't like correctly to call second order probabilities, but you never mentioned them. So what, what do you think? Is there potential for these methods or? Yes, I, I think there, and, and um, I probably naively um, tend to group P-box methods with in interval estimation. Oh, okay, 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 yep. Okay, so so to you is just particular yeah. case of this interval, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, okay, yes. Uh, thanks, Vladek. Um, I, leave, I believe Bills wants to ask, to ask a question too. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Bill. Yeah, loud yep. and clear. Uh, very nice talk, Laura. You uh, you covered the practical issues of computing these um, uh, imprecise probabilities. And uh, I want to stress that uh, there are not many organizations that have really delved into this practical issue uh, like Sandia has. There are a few, but uh, I think Sandia is, is really the lead on that, not only in applied uh, risk analyses like underground storage of waste, but also in uh, other applications. And some people, in fact, someone earlier made the comment about we have all this computing power that uh, we should be, we would not, we're now able to compute all these samples. That's not the case. If you really believe that this computing power uh, is uh, available, you don't understand how physics modeling is going in engineering. This power is being used to get more and more computationally expensive models. That is, That will always be the case. Engineers and physicists, whether it's find an element, whatever you're in, you will continually refine the fidelity of these models where they will always be at the edge of what is affordable on single calculations. So this issue of doing UQ or sensitivity analysis uh, will always have a problem with the number of function evaluations because the physicists and engineers that develop finite element models and so on, they will always stress fidelity over UQ because that's the world they come from. And a lot of people don't really understand that people like Laura and others at Sandy and Mike Eldred, they understand that because you're in the world of trying to actually produce simulations on very expensive uh, computational simulations. So my that's sort of an editorial comment. And of course, people like Laura, they, she understands that because she's trying to actually compute results. So I guess my general comment is uh, the issue of using surrogate models uh, I think many times that is a more serious weakness than what people recognize. And uh, just because it's a favorite of mine, let me pick on the Bayesians first. When, when you use sur surrogate models, of course, they've been used for decades. And that's the only reason that Bayesian estimation is practically possible is because you, you can't afford to do even a relatively cheap model with all of the evaluations that you need to do the inverse problem. And so the general point is that the numerical error in the construction of these surrogate models is essentially never examined, but it is actually a numerical error. And I don't know how we change that culture, but I never see Bayesian address that, what's the numerical error in the construction of the, of, the, uh, of the surrogate. So I think in terms of a culture change, that needs to be a paid attention to because you can have very few samples constructed in surrogate, but you'll never see that error because now you assume that the surrogate model is correct. So, uh, Laura, how do you how do you feel about strategic weaknesses, whether it's imprecise probability or Bayesian? I, I think that's a strategic weakness that we have to deal with or have to face. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I guess two two comments. One is that we have to um, 
extend uncertainty calculations um, you know, in the way that we use surrogates in optimization, there's a, tr a an approach called a trust region approach where we use the surrogate, but then when we get to the optimal point, we stop, we run the true simulation, right? To understand, you know, how, how off are we, you know, and, and then we may re-optimize and, and sort of adaptively you know, use the surrogate for the bulk of the computations, but then correct at critical points. So for interval analysis, we'd want to do that correction at the bounds, right? So, so the surrogate says, here are my bounds, but then we need to do a little bit more work to evaluate the true, uh, you know, the true computation simulation at those. So, so I think we, we, we need to do more work in that arena. And then there are, um, there's starting to be a, a lot of interest in the computational science community in these multi-fidelity methods. And so what they do is take a relatively you know, small number of high fidelity, these, you know, the big grid I showed uh, for the crystalline uh, case and lots of lower fidelity simulations. And um, some of the methods are control variant. I mean, there's different ways of co combining those but there's not a surrogate involved. Uh, there can be, but there, you, typically the low fidelity model is of course a, a cheaper grid, right, to, to run. And so those methods I think have a lot of promise, but again, those methods, there's a lot of statistical assumptions under the hood. And I, I think it's gonna be a while before they're really used um, widely in the computational community. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point on these these multi fidelity models. Some people who are seeing these models develop, they don't really understand why are people making these. Why not just do the high fidelity model? And it's exactly what you said: is that people that actually have to produce risk analyses on real systems, real engineering systems, you cannot afford these. You cannot. And so I think multi fidelity modeling is a really interesting combination between physics approximations and statistical approximations. And so I, I think it is a very promising effort and I know you guys are working on it. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, I would just like to, I think Enrique has one last question. So maybe you have time for one more. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for, thank you very much for your talk and I was wondering, um, optimization-based interval analysis, um, I think it's good in the sense that it provides the rigorous um, interval output, right? So you get, um, well, maybe not rigorous, but much better than sampling, as you um, said in the presentation. But sometimes, uh, I think sometimes you are not, so, someone might not be so interested about the exact bounds of the output because um, it might be the case that they are anal analyzing something that is not um, like the, perhaps they're more interested in the in the length of the interval than in the um, in bounds themselves. I'm not sure if I'm making sense. Um, so it might be the case that optimization based um, might not be the best thing to do. Also, optimization based um, cannot provide this um, um, feasible or unfeasible regions with uh, that you can visualize with the um, scatter plots. So if you have if you have sampling, you generate a lot of different points that you um, let's say if you want to to test if uh, they fulfill certain constraints or something in the model, that's not possible with uh, with optimization based. And also I was wondering if you know if it would be possible to do alongside interval analysis, um, some, some sort of sensitivity analysis with the sampling based methods. Like you could, for instance, do light, light in hypercube sampling and then you get the, the output, the interval output, but you can also measure the impact of the different um, um, inputs in the output. 
do you think that would be possible? I don't think that would be possible with uh, optimization based, but perhaps with sampling based could be. So, so that is true. Um, if you use, um, you know, pure interval, um, pure, op you know, an optimization approach for interval uh, propagation, then you, you're not getting sensitivity analysis. I think in practice, what, what people do is, um, at least what, what we do in Sandia, we, we do do both, right? So we will start, um, we'll always start, you know, when we, we initially develop a, a computational model to do some Latin hypercube sampling to understand the sensitivities and, and um, you know, to, to make sure that we're seeing uh, input output behavior that we expect. So, um, I don't think it will necessarily always be an either or. Um, I, you know, you you are correct that um, one advantage of sampling, as as I said, I think at the beginning, is um, you can use those samples both to do the uncertainty propagation, but also oh, to do sensitivity analysis. That, and that that really is a nice uh, aspect of sampling, um, and and you also could use those samplings to control samples to construct a surrogate model, which also could be used for the propagation and the uh, sensitivity analysis. So, so I, and visualization, if you've got a high dimensional visualization. So, so, um, so I, you know, I, I agree that there's certainly advantages of sampling and we, we would probably, we, we, we tend to use both. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for everyone for posing their questions and thank you very much to Laura again for a really excellent talk. Um, I would love to move on to our next part of the session, which is uh, our open discussion around do epistemic and aleatory need different calculi. So Didier has been quiet for a while and I know he, uh, he made some excellent points during his presentation. So would you like to start off with a, with a few thoughts, Didier? If he's still around. Okay. Uh, uh, we can hear you. Works. Okay. No, but I think that in my talk, I, I, I tend to defend the option that, yes, we need different calculi. And the problem is that for me, epistemic uncertainty and aleatory uncertainty are different things that needs different actions to be handled. So if you use the same calculus, it means if you represent both by probability distributions, then in the end, when of a big computation such as Laura showed us, where you have many parameters with uh, some with un epistemic uncertainty, some with aleatory uncertainty, in the, in the end, you get a big probability distribution and uh, you cannot tell um, the variance due to one and the variance due to the other. Uh, so, so to me, epistemic uh, uh, uncertainty, if, if really you, you have missing information, it means that you should use uh, dempster schaefer or uh, imprecise probabilities or possibility theory. That does not mean that you are uh, completely foreign to probability, but I, I doubt that epistemic knowledge that represent, represented by a single probability distribution just mean that you're, you you have so much knowledge, like you have uh, already the frequencies behind your. your I mean, you 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 are, have access to frequencies. Then, then you can, of course, measure your belief by the frequencies, and then you 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 do the same with uh, epistemic al aleatory. But most of the time. When epistemic uncertainty due, is due to mere lack of information, you should use weaker models than probability to, 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 to represent your uncertainty and propagate. Because then in the end, you can see the difference between uh, the, the, the reason, I mean, the, the uncertainty due to uh, epistemic information and the uncertainty due to variability at the end in, in your, at the end of your computations, you can see the difference. And for me, this is very important to make correct decisions 
reduce the epistemic uncertainty or change the system, as, as Laura said in her talk, because uh, aleatory uh, uncertainty, if you want to face it, you have to change the system in some way. You cannot just collect new information, it will not change anything. So this is why I think they need different calculus. Okay. Thanks, Didier. Um, do you have any any disagreements or or points to make, Laura, on this? Maybe I interpreted the question differently. Um, I feel that the representation of epistemic uncertainty can be very, certainly different from that of aleatory uncertainty, but in terms of a the the calculus and the actual operations, things like you know, like I talked about using samples or opt. I mean, I think we've got we've got the calculus down. So I'm not, that's what I, I meant when I said no, that we don't need to invent a new new calculus ne necessarily. Um, um, I, I think the, the calculation, yeah, uh, yeah it, it's but the representation. I do agree that um, I, I only you know discuss three possibilities of representation and, and there are many others. The, actually the point is that I am more in artificial intelligence than in uh, I would say computations, uh, numerical computations and you know, in artificial intelligence we we always insist on representing knowledge and the representation is very important and so it is because the two types or the two origins of uncertainty aleatory and epistemic are so different we consider that we need different tools to represent. Then, of course, then the, the, the computational tools uh, th that you have can be applied. It is absolutely true that, for instance, if you want to make interval propagation, you can make sampling. That's very clear. And then you get an idea of the, 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 the outcome by, by ranging of, over the samples. This is clear. So, so you may have similar methods for probabilities and for other types of and, and anyway, for instance, propagating uh, uh, belief functions, you need to, to have both interval analysis methods and Monte Carlo, the two things together. And you, even you can use some kind of Monte Carlo for interval as well. So I agree with, with Laura that uh, the, the basic tools for computations are kind of common to the two in some sense. But the, still, the, in the end, you would like to highlight the uncertainty due to epistemic ignorance and the uncertainty due to variability in, 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 in the results of the computations. I think that is very important to highlight the two separately. If they are all mixed up, this is problematic for interpreting the results, I suppose. May I jump in? Feel free, please. I think. Uh... We can we can move to opening the floor to anyone that would like to unmute their microphone and, and contribute. Okay, so um, say taking the examples that uh, Laura showed, uh, and when we want to represent some epistemic uncertainty with Dempster Schaeffer and the because. It was. It is too expensive to do all the computations with all the different evidence levels. Um, one cool thing that well, why not just rewrite the code of all the computations and expand it, go step by step with all the all the evidence uh, measures, step by step, and all in all the com computations and get at the end the whole possibility measure. Um, that will mean to rewrite a lot of code. Is that a different calculi? And if we had it, we, we will use it, right? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand what, what you're... Um, or, or, or let, let's say just to... kind of with the intervals. Uh, we, we add up two intervals, right? Uh, we can do the propagation of the interval addition with samples, yes, of course, and also with just interval computations. It's a lot more expensive when you go with uh, uh, complex computations, of course, but it is a different calculi, right? 
yes. Um, um, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure how embedded or intrusive into the code that would need to be. Um, I and sort of some of the uh, some of what we see in um, people starting to look at redoing computational things are there things like rewriting codes to take advantage of um, um, oh it like advanced C++ structures so uh, with operator overloading when you ask for a function evaluation you get you get the gr gradients at that grid cell point you, you know uh, analytically and and so would you get intervals from that like you say not really getting much more intrusive and um, people in the solution of partial differential equations are thinking of re instead of you know we always do here's the sample and then here's our code well what if you had here's the code and I'm key uh, the code is this huge set of it, it ends up being you know a huge ax equals b that you're solving iteratively as you go through the pde right and so if you if you parameterize that and have your it, almost like a an inner loop vector that your ax equal b operation is acting on, then you're reverting that sampling loop, and with you know, and and you're doing it more like propagating the uncertainty intrinsically to the to your solve. And so again, that's um, very intrusive to the code. I think we're a ways off from this kind of stuff being um, generally available, but ideally that will hopefully solve, you know, many of the questions that we've been talking about today. So we're not having to run separate calculation, you know, we're not having to run thousands of the samples are, it's, it's sort of intrusive. So, so I, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> And can, can I jump in here? Yes, because yeah. I think it's related. Yes. So uh, that's kind of the problem is, as everywhere, I mean, like in interval computations, there have been like a pipe dream from the very beginning when Moore wrote his book that now everything will just switch from normal computations to interval computations and everything will be nice. But of course, it doesn't work that way. So yes, you can take any code and insert there uh, a modify it to take into account uncertainty, but that will make this code more complicated. So like, for example, and that's kind of brings a lot of limitations. That's what Laura and others are doing uh, to avoid that. Because normally if you just take a normal code uh, for solving linear systems, it can solve systems of maybe 10,000 by 10,000. And then if you add interval computations or whatever uncertainty, the size that you can handle immediately shrinks drastically. <laughs> And you need to do a lot of effort to make sure that it works. So yes, it would be nice, but unfortunately we cannot afford that for real life, big size problems. So hopefully I'm just complimenting what Laura was saying as an answer, yes. Thanks, Vladek. I believe uh, Bill wants to chip in here as well. Yeah, I... Uh... This was a question I wanted to ask uh, Professor Dubois. Uh, first time I've seen you give a talk. Uh, we, well, I guess we'd call it in person. It's very nice to see you. I've read uh, a lot of your work over the years. It was a very nice talk. My question is, I'm kind of confused between uh, two sets of terminology. You use the terminology of creedal sets, but I see other researchers use this term of what they call co-monotonic clouds. And I can't say that I really understand exactly what that means. Can you help us uh, relate? Are, are they the same thing and just different terms? Or are they actually different? Did you, sorry, I think your microphone is muted. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, nice to meet you in the, uh, for the first time as well, because I knew your name. So let me answer your question about common clouds and uh, cradle sets. 
So cradle sets is a very generic term to, 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 to name uh, convex sets of probabilities. So you can get convex sets of probabilities in a very general setting. I mean, uh, uh, for instance, you, you take any set of probabilities, you take that, that convex closure and you get a cradle set. So in the terminology of imprecise probabilities, uh, the, the, the name cradle sets is for convex sets of probabilities. Now, common antenic clouds are special cases of cradle sets. And basically, uh, common, uh, just maybe I, I, I suppose that it would be a bit difficult. I have some slides I could give another talk on common antenic clouds, but I don't uh, want to plan to do it. But anyway, for, for simplicity, a common antenic cloud is, is a kind of P box, except that P box are based on cumulative distributions. I mean, either going up or going down, okay? But uh, if you consider two-sided cumulative distributions, and you can view possibility distributions as two-sided uh, cumulative distributions, that is to say you go away from one point, from one point you go away a little bit and you take the probability of these intervals, the wider, the wider they get. So it's kind of cumulative, but, uh, so, so you, you, you consider two side, this type of two-sided cumulatives and the equivalent of a P-box. So you have another one below, instead of having on the left side, on the right side, it's just below. And so this is equivalent morally to two, prob two possibility distributions. Each possibility distribution gives you a cradle set, not a general cradle set, a, a specific possibility distribution cradle set. Okay, and then you take the intersection of the two. And this gives you the, the, the cradle set associated to a common autonic cloud. So it's called common autonic because the two distributions, the one below the other, uh, should, should uh, rise together and go down together. So they are common autonic. And so you take the two uh, sets of probabilities induced by each of the, uh, of the possibility distributions and you make the intersection. This is exactly what you do with P-box, you know? You you, you, if you take the, the upper cumulative, then you take all probabilities to the, to the, to, to, to the right of it. So this it gives you a, a cradle set. And then you have the lower cumulative, you take all the probabilities to the left of it, and you make the intersection. This is exactly the same. Uh, so common antenna cloud is a special case, gives you a special case of cradle set. That is okay, that... representable by really function, by the way. The, this common autonicity okay, that... makes you sure that the cradle set is a, is a cradle set associated to a belief function, which is a special kind of cradle set again. Not all cradle sets corresponds to, to belief functions. That, that really helps because I've been confused about that. And yeah. so would it be fair to summarize to say that co-monotonic clouds are really much more closely related to P boxes, yes. whereas you said uh, cradle sets are really a larger set yes. of of, of multi-valued probabilities. Absolutely. And uh, I re would refer you to a paper that I wrote in, uh, uh, I think it's in the Journal of Approximate Reasoning with Sebastian Desterck and, and another colleague, uh, Shoshnaki, where we make a review of these type of things and we give in details the, the cradle set induced by a common autonic cloud. So there, there is a paper and I can send you the reference if you just send me an email. Uh, okay. And I can send you the, the, the reference if you like. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any more comments or, or points from, from the Sorry crowd? Sorry to take too much time again. <laughs> no problem at all. I, I have one more. So I, I just Please. want to yeah. kind of have it clear in my head. Um, so say with interval arithmetic, we, we have a problem, computational problem. We want to change all the numbers by intervals. It's too costly. Um, in the practical problems, when you have kind of some time to spare to do the analysis, is it that there are missing implementations for the correct uh, successive transformation of the uncertainty? Or is it that one has to come up with 
uh, picked methods for the application. Like in your case, let's say I want to study the intervals, let's do some local optimization in some steps, and we get something which is more reliable. But it still is not completely correct or complete. Um, I'm not sure if I uh, understand. So, so we have the, I mean, the, the optimization methods exist. I think I didn't speak at all about how one obtains those interval estimates. Antonio Hagen in the very first talk in this series, you know, talked about how important it is to do um, to, to properly assess and, and represent the uncertainties. And so we, through structured elicitations and he had, you know, so has a whole framework for doing that. So I didn't really, I didn't, I had assumed that that was part was already done and we would have say an interval defined or, or a belief structure defined or something. Um, so given that um, assumption, then I was just focusing on the problem of taking that and propagating it. And for that, I think we, the methods are, are existing and, and we can say something formal about if the input uncertainty is represented with these intervals, you know, can we get convergent results in terms of output bounds with, optim you know, with optimization methods? But I don't think that was your, maybe exactly your question. Um, so if we stick with the optimization methods, uh, there is still, the result is, is still not the, the real bound, right? So, so we know it's better, but we, it's, it's still not the correct result. Um, so it is still an approximation of the more costly interval arithmetic that you will put on yeah. overall the code, right? Uh, so the question is a little bit is, is it just that interval arithmetic is inherently slow and therefore it cannot be computed? Or we are not so good in doing optimizations for interval arithmetic in, in this case. Uh, can can I just to... interfere here? So interval computations in general is NP-hard already for quadratic functions. Mm. So like with every NP-hard problem, it's of course inherently complex. On the other hand, just with every other NP-hard problem, uh, it's a never ending uh, search for better and more efficient methods. Sorry for jumping in. No, no that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, I, I would add, though, you say that we can't get exact bounds with optimization. Um, for black box models, which we have, you know, we're assuming here that that's true. But if you are willing to um, if you have more knowledge and can pose the problem as a convex optimization problem or other things, there are things that you can do to say, I do have a, a true, you know, to say that, yes, you do have a true, you do have the true, the actual bounds. Through, yeah, but I mean, that's, yeah. that's what NP hardness means. If you have even quadratic function, yeah. then the time grows exponentially with yeah. N. If you have 10 variables, you can do that. If you have thousands of variables, as in many real life models, two to the power of thousand is not realistic. So there is no way. That's correct. But I thought, Ramundo, we were asking about just the existence of the actual bounds. And I, oh, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. No, uh, kind, kind of in the problems you faced, I don't know, did you even try uh, doing the computations with everything with arithmetic? Or, or did you just thought, well, putting interval uh, arithmetic all over the place, it, it, it will not work. Um, can you clarify what you mean? So, so when there was... Because um... optimization is a way to, uh, to produce, I mean, computing the, the resulting interval exactly means computing the maximum and minimum of the function. So it's not like optimization is a different way of solving it, optimization is exactly the problem of interval computations. It is computing to maximum and minimum of the function on the given box. So uh, if you are asking if other methods have been used, yes, they have been used. 
or maybe you're asking about something else. Maybe you are yes. under the naive impression that there is something you. called interval, interval arithmetic where you just plug in intervals instead of uh, operations. That are, but that, of course, doesn't work already for very simple examples. You Can need I to jump, use jump in here, techniques there. Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. I think it might be Enrique, in fact. Yeah, well, Nick has, uh, has his hand raised. But anyway, I, will, I would say that. Um, so I think what he means, what uh, Raimundo means, is that with the um, interval arithmetic, you, you get, well, if you, if you can do it, you'll always get the rigorous bounds. But with optimization, you still rely on the, on the optimization algorithm. And No, 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 and, wait, wait, wait. But that's, that's not, uh, I don't understand the difference. Well, let, let me think. Interval arithmetic means you're computing the range of the function. Yeah, computing but you don't know if the, if the function, function is convex. Exactly, you're computing the maximum of the function and the minimum of the function. You might right? be falling in a local minimum, for example. So you might- No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Of course, what you are saying is this, no matter what you do, you don't get the exact maximum and the exact minimum, right? But it's not like, you, you sound as if there are two different methods. So what you are saying is that optimization methods do not lead to the exact maximum. Yes, of course. Well, not always. It depends on the on the, for example, the initial conditions, the step size. Right, the... right, right. So no, very, very rarely in big problems like this, you get the exact maximum and the exact minimum. You get approximations. Some are better, some are worse. Is it? But is it not the the case that at some point it doesn't? If you're so, if we're saying we're using the the interval to represent the the episode so you could say okay so we're using this interval because we know that the true value must lie somewhere within these bounds mm -hmm. and we then compute that and we could get um sort of a an interval that's perhaps larger than it needs to be because through some other analysis we show that actually some bits of this interval are possible for whatever reason but it, it's still a valid interval in terms of with at the end of the calculation, we're still saying, well, the true value lies between these bounds. This, this is not the case for, so there are, okay, okay. So there are two techniques. So like in interval computations community, there is a big distinction. There are methods which provide guaranteed bounds, which are bounds from above. Mm -hmm. uh, they are much more difficult to get. What Laura is talking mostly is the method that provide approximation, but they do not give the guarantee. Let, let, me, uh, let me also enter in there it, from a practical standpoint. In engineering calculations, you don't need a guaranteed bound. The, the, to think that you need that, no, that's not what you need. What you need is an approximation to it that you can afford given the number of function evaluations that you can afford. And so I, 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 I think I'm understanding your point, Vladek, that even though the philosophy is very different on the two approaches, engineering doesn't need guaranteed bounds in many cases. What you need is an approximation. So, Vladek, let me ask you something. I, I, I've been wanting to ask you a question and, and it's related to this. When I see your Cauchy Deviates method work, I, I'm just amazed that it works that well for all epistemic uncertainties. And I'm trying to put that together with why that works so well for thousands of intervals. And it is an approximate method, but I am just amazed that it works so well. So in the sense of approximate methods, why does it work that well? Maybe Laura knows, or maybe Professor Duwad knows, but I, I don't understand why it works that well. Do you see my question? Well, I mean, that's, that's a very technical specific question. It works so well because it's kind of a direct analog of Monte Carlo simulations with Gaussian distributions. It so happened, but it only works in the linearized case. In the cases when Laura cited, where you have A plus B to the power A, which is highly nonlinear, Cauchy methods would not work. It would give a very wrong approximation. But I've seen, maybe, maybe the methods where I've seen it applied, I've seen it by people at NASA Langley, it's a, it's a nonlinear problem, but it amazed no, everybody no, no, how well no, it no, works. I mean, so, but maybe it's not as nonlinear as what we thought it was. No, no, no. Let, let me clarify. 
of course, the problem is nonlinear, but it is linear within the narrow range of the values that we know. So if we have a plus b to the power a, it can be nonlinear. But if we have small bounds on a narrow ranges on a and b, within these bounds, we can ignore quadratic and higher order terms and approximate it well by linear expressions. If we have a plus b to the power a, whatever it was, where a is from one to 10, then we cannot do that. Okay, that, that helps me understand it better. So it really depends not only on the nonlinearity, but the range of the, yes, yes, the, yes, the yes. bounds themselves. Right, right. Of course, okay. of course, all the, everything is nonlinear in the real world, but yes. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, it's, it's an approximate method. So it's, it's not a guaranteed bound, as you said, yes. Okay, sorry to, to interrupt. I know that we've run slightly over and sometimes the conversations continue after our session, but I'd just like to use this opportunity to, to thank our speakers again, Laura and, uh, and Didier for their amazing talks and, and for taking the time to participate and for the excellent conversations that they stimulated in, uh, in both the, the questions and answers, but also our, our, the past 30 minutes. So thank you again. Um, I think everyone can join us in a round of applause. Okay, sorry, and, um, Francis. Can you can you put in the in the chat the Zoom link to the next uh, to the next meeting? Of course, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, I try to send an email before every session as well to the people that registered for the for the thing. I, I didn't the, get it this time. Uh, did you not? That's that's no. frustrating. Apologies. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Um, Francis, you might also mention your plans for the new uh, series when you're done. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just going to put in the session for communication, which currently is due on the March the 25th at 4 p.m. GMT. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat and I'll make sure to, to send it again by everyone through the link that they registered with. Um, and the mailing list. We also are thinking of starting a, a new series of talks based on emerging industries and opportunities and trade-offs around technologies such as uh, CRISPR and gene editing, um, things like uh, autonomous vehicles, alternative energy, psychedelic medicine, sex robots, so quite obscure topics that maybe people haven't really spoken about in the public forum around what could go wrong with those with those technologies and the potential that they could have to revolutionize um, the way that we live our lives essentially um, so I'm, I'm planning on doing a series of talks around may and june if you are open to to suggesting ideas or um anything that they would like to see please let us know um, you can email me via the the same email i've been using for the mailing list um, and i'll put my email in the chat Also, I don't know whether Scott, you'd like to make any closing remarks around um, around the talk and then and our speakers. We'd just like to thank them again on behalf of the, the institute. Yeah, well, just to thank very much the speakers today, and of course through the rest of the series, Laura and uh, uh, DGA. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, I, I was really excited and pleased that you were able to attend. Thank you for inviting us. It was very, very nice. Um, so. Uh, are, are we, I guess we've gone quite a while uh, over. Maybe we're, it's time to let them <laughs> go live their lives. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I have a, a call that I I'm, I'm need to attend in five, 10 minutes, but I'll leave the, the call open in case anyone wants to stick around and, and have a friendly chat. Thanks, Francis. Thank you very much. See you at the next session, everyone. Thank you, Frances. Thank you very much for everybody. A nice meeting you, you, Laura. Yes, <laughs> likewise. Thanks. Thank you. It's, it's a great series, Scott. Thank, thanks so much to oh, you and Frances for organizing it. I'm so Thank glad. you so much, Professor Laura and Professor Dubois. Thank you so much. OK. All right. Thank you so much again. See you later. Thanks, Frances.